You're getting two dudes talking about whatever they want to talk about. Sort of. Hello. Good November. Good November. Y'all didn't think we was going to do one, did you? Uh, y'all got a little scared. You thought the podcast was a can't camp past three. Three and outs, just like last year. But nope, we're back. We're here. It's just uh, it was a busy couple months, you know. It's been very busy. Yeah. The last episode, you were talking to single and married. Now, double married. Double double married. Yep. Yep. That was a, a good time. It like everybody says, it was a blur. I don't really remember much of it. It, it was a good <laughs> it was a good time though. Yeah, it was a good time. I had old Zach with me and uh, couldn't make it without him, so there you go. We weren't pipe casting the wedding. Now that yeah. would have been an interesting thing. Yeah, that would have been. But well, I don't know if Patrick would have been speaking as much as he nor he just been yeah. uh, <laughs> uh yeah. That would have been a good way to do a face reveal. Mm-hmm. Is here's a random wedding. Can you guess who's who? <laughs> um but well, no. we're in the we're in the post Thanksgiving era right now. Yep, yep. Leftover. Got through Black Friday. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like you said, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, well, at least after Thanksgiving, we're having leftovers, but not turkey. <laughs> we are doing a review, re-review, a revisit. Yeah, a revisit of L.J. Peretti's Thanksgiving Day. If you guys remember, I think we did this last year. I don't know. I didn't really re-listen to that episode, but I remember not being a, a fan of this blend. Yeah. Um, and it's been jarred for a year now. Yeah, it's been jarred. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You want to get into it right now? I mean, this is kind of how we intro everything. So, you know, so I mean, I could give you, a, you know, L.J. Peretti's a great blender. I like L.J. Peretti's number eight slices. They have a really fine array of tobaccos. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think they are sort of predominantly a Burley-based company. Um, and this is a Burley-based tobacco. Uh, like a lot of kind of oddball aromatics, they lean heavy on Burley to kind of give you a big mouth feel of smoke. It leaves you a little wanting in sort of complex flavors. There is some Virginian here, and then the rest is sort of muddled with uh, some fruit essences and juices and rum. Uh, I remember when we got it, uh, really impressed with the smell of it out the gate. Thought mm-hmm. it was going to be quite the smoke. Um, it was definitely blander than I had imagined. So here we are a year later to see if age has served it well. Uh, from my understanding, age doesn't do much for um, aromatics, really, burly or anything. Uh, it just doesn't, uh, from what I gather. I can taste the age on this. Yeah, I, mean, cause I literally had to dust off of the tin because I haven't touched it since Thanksgiving last year. Yeah. It's just been sitting there. Um, I mean, I might have been a little harsh. I hope, I hope I'm not actually sort of contradicting myself by saying that age really doesn't have anything to do or doesn't do anything for aromatics or burly and then you give this a year and it tastes a little bit better but i think i i think maybe my palate has changed over the course of the last year anyway i've been smoking a lot more aromatic blends Mm. Um, a lot of lakeland blends i've been all over the samuel galwith and galwith hogarth chart here lately And then with the new introduction of Ken Byron, Ken Byron has very complex uh, tobaccos that I think a lot of people would deem aromatic. So I've been smoking a lot of that lately. And this is tolerable. It still isn't as, as, I'm not gung-ho about it. It's still not quite as interesting as, like, I, I mean, it's not as boring as I remember it being, but it's not... It's not something that's just, I'm going to put in my pipe all the time and just be like, oh, well, it's the mm-hmm. most coveted tobacco. It's not really that at all. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think, uh, if I'm remembering, remembering correctly, yeah, it, it, I definitely felt last time it had, um, it definitely, it didn't have any body to it. 
you know, the as much as they try to get some mouthfeel with the burley, yeah, it just really light and um, not a lot going on. And I really don't, it don't feel different to me. Um, it feels very similar to last year. Um, if anything, I think the room note is a little bit, the only way I can describe it is more cigarette-like mm -hmm. in its smell. I mean, so, that's that burly coming out, yeah. I think. I think if you guys are interested in it, I don't think I would say don't buy it. I'd say probably buy the four ounce, I think, which is the smallest uh, yeah. amount you can get. This is, if you if you guys are familiar with brick and mortar shops, every brick and mortar shop has their own blends. Uh, and they're usually like, have all these cherry, coffee, mint, creme de mint, something, blah, 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 blah. Um, and they, they're just burly based, heavy syrup uh, tobacco. With, and they're not particularly very interesting tobaccos. Uh, this is a step above that. Yeah. So it's like if you, you know, your, your old school brick and mortar shops that seem like they don't put a lot of effort into pipe tobacco, probably because they're more concerned with cigar sales, which I think is their bread and butter. Nothing wrong with that. Or tin tobacco, which I'm sure, you know, is their backbone. Uh, they don't usually put a lot of effort into their mixtures. Uh, this feels like someone who actually cares about their mixtures, uh, but still sort of hit the same mark in terms of a bland aromatic yeah. blend. If you're if you're anything like me, a lot of times, I think this happens a lot with different things. Like as we grow up, you know, like you may have a nostalgic feeling to something, maybe some snack you used to eat or something. Maybe there's a tradition, a holiday tradition that you do where you eat certain things at certain times, and there's a, maybe a nostalgic factor to it. If if you're that if you're susceptible to that kind of thing, buy you one of these and just smoke it every Thanksgiving. It'll be it'll be fine because it it's not a bad blend. Mm -hmm. it, it's just not you know it's it's not up to par with some of your you know more well known blends. But you know get one and smoke it every Thanksgiving. L let it keep aging. You know smoke one everything and let it be sort of like a tradition kind of thing for you. And I think that's what I want to do with this is yeah. I kind of want to traditionally pull this out after every episode and see you know, what's the difference between zero to one year to two year to i mean yeah. i'm only smoking about a bowl of this a year so i mean i can't imagine how long this is going to last did, did you probably be the last bowl will be our 10th thanksgiving episode of yeah the 20th. um did you do anything other than just putting it in the jar no i didn't do anything i put it in a jar i sealed the jar and i put it in a box now when you reopened it did you have to do anything to it no. The, it, it was all good. And then most of the aromatic, most of my tobaccos, I, I hear a lot of people online saying that their stuff needs to be like sort of remoist or remoisturized, mm -hmm. and the seal usually keeps it about dead perfect, in my really? opinion. If you don't get into it all the time, yeah. Especially and this is a this is sort of a loose press, so ultimately the pressing helps the moisture content i know that like uh jackknife plug and uh peterson's three p's or the three p's uh those they're so compressed that you're really not going to lose moisture content because i mean i think they put like a 500 pound pressure uh press on them and yeah. they're so right. compressed that I mean, good lord, I don't even know if there could be any moisture in it anyway, but they're so pressed that it, it seems like they don't lose moisture content. I know that is the case with, I could probably leave out Curly Block. You remember Curly Block? Oh yeah, that's good stuff. And uh, it wouldn't affect it any. Really? It's just because it's so compressed. I mean, yeah. That, and, you know. I've had a lot of issues with my um, Cornell and Dill fine cuts. Um, which, you know, I, I take them out of the original tin and I put them in a jar. And I, I, I have to sort of, you know, bring them back to life a little bit. I know I did with my haunted bookshop um, this past summer. A shag and, gives me a fit. Really? Yeah. I, I guess the finer the cut, it, yeah. the more you're going to have an issue with it. Um, but, you know, because like you said, the blocks really 
don't have it, but the but the shag and fine cut or you know cur uh, ribbon cut seem to give me a, a fit. But no, yeah. To to wrap it back up to to Thanksgiving Day from L.J. Peretti. It's it's good. It it, it works. It, yeah. That's definitely true. Yeah, it stays lit. I think you can smoke it all day if you're not a powerhouse smoker or anything like that, where you need six or seven bowls uh, to kind of keep you going. This is fine to stick in. You're not losing anything. I think there's you know anything is relatively smokable. It's not disgusting. I don't spit it out of my mouth, but I definitely prefer to reach for something a little bit more interesting than this particular blend. I think. Uh, with all aromatics too, burley based aromatics especially, they have a tendency to give you some tongue bite if you're not careful. This doesn't seem to do that quite as much. So it's a nice peaceful smoke. You're definitely not going to get any complaints on the room note, I don't think. But it doesn't keep that consistent flavor that you would probably get at the beginning towards the end. And the burleys have a tendency to get just a teensy bit bitter at the end too. Yeah, um, I'm I'm having a time keeping it lit, but I finally got it going now. Uh, I did well trying to get it lit. I, I may have started the rumblings of a little tongue bite, but I don't get tongue bite often, so uh, I'm really trying to chief audit to get it going. I mean, I've returned to uh, Blair Gallery. Uh, I've been smoking um, what is it called? Plague mixture by ken byron so a lot of i like scottish mixtures so oriental ford with a condimental latakia mm -hmm. and that's what i usually smoke in the winter i like all my sour and virginia like sour oriental virginia sort of flavors with just a touch of smoke in the back end from the latakia i think i like scottish blends they're my preferred English are fine. I think they're so Latakia Ford that it's like, well, what is it? I mean, there's an old saying yeah. about, like, uh, take any fruit you want to and make a smoothie, but if you add a banana to it, it's a banana smoothie. Hmm. Well, that's kind of the way I feel about Latakia. Hmm. I don't feel like people have a very fine touch in it. Anything you add to it, it's going to be a Latakia. That's why I think uh, the most, I guess, virulent, sort of aggressive uh, tobacco connoisseurs are people who love vapor blends oh yeah uh, because i mean they'll smoke a latakia blend but i think that they just seem to be the most outraged by anything outside of virginia and mm. perique you know you don't they don't usually dabble in oriental yeah. they don't it's not a vapor if it has any other condimental tobacco in it really yeah. usually they get like kind of frustrated about latakia so hardcore vapor fans i think are usually the most sort of dogmatic about their blends or at least that's my experience they always are like they'll you know they'll take a puff of something and they're like what is that is that latakia <laughs> i mean because like i have a hard time getting people um, vapor lovers to accept fillmore because they're so dead set or convinced that fillmore has latakia in it and they won't touch it mm. and i think fillmore is one of the best gop's vapor blends out there i mean latakia is definitely like you said, or as my dad would say, the old the old saying about, I don't know, some kind of some kind of shaving cream, a little dab will do you. Like mm -hmm. you don't need to do a lot. Um, if I want a Latakia, just I just I go for Artisan's Blend or or like Nightcap, mm -hmm. you know, like go for those, and then there's really no need to go any further in my book. And I don't really consider those lat bombs either. No, it's not like no. You know, because I think plum pudding has a little bit more robustness. Mm -hmm. I, definitely pirate's cake. Yep. And uh, Commonwealth. You got Commonwealth, Star of the East. You know, they're they're super being like it. I just don't think you need that. I, I think, like I said, I think Artisan's Blend and, and you know, like you said, plum pudding and nightcap, things like that. Um, Chelsea Morning. Chelsea Morning, I do feel like any type of morning tobacco, I think, because Chelsea Morning is one of my favorite English blends. Yeah. However, I do feel like there's an argument to be made that they lean more towards a Scottish blend than they do an mm. English blend because yeah. I think that they cut back on the Latakia content. Mm. I wouldn't say that it is condimental the way a Scottish blend usually is. It's somewhere it, in the middle. But I think it's in the middle. And mm. I think lessening the Latakia 
actually gives you a little bit more. Yeah. But I, like I said, I've been smoking Blair Gowrie lately, which is another Peas blend, but under the Drucker and Sons label. I don't know. But it's uh, it's definitely, you know, between Blair Gowrie and Chelsea Morning, those are my two favorite sort of Latakia, you know, well, at least it has Latakia, and I wouldn't say Latakia based or mm-hmm. Latakia blend. That's almost giving it too much credit. But, like, that has Latakia in it, I think those two really stand the test of, stand up to the test of other tobaccos. Yeah. Whew. Like I said here lately, though, I've absolutely been diving into aromatics so much. I just yeah. recently purchased uh, Burley Morning Pipe, which is a Ken Byron Ventures. Yeah. Uh, coffee i guess aromatic blend which is a burley base so we're going to see how i'm curious how this reason i really wanted to smoke thanksgiving day again because it's a burley base i wanted to see how ken byron handled it because i haven't had any missteps from him and then because i've been obsessed with chocolate flavored tobaccos and i guess i probably hear the universal pipe community groan right now because i'm talking aromatics but uh, (laughs) try bob's chocolate flake or try C, uh, CF Flake or CH Flake, Chocolate Flake from Samuel Galworth. They're different. I promise you they're different. I prefer Bob's Chocolate to, you know, Chocolate Flake. But they're so good. They are so absolutely amazing. Ken Byron sells Galworth and Hogarth and Samuel Galworth. So I know that there is some sort of, like, influence there. Yeah. That he kind of understands that chocolate flavoring. So I got his chocolate pa uh, blend, and I want to see how he does a chocolate blend. Like I said, I like all his tobaccos. He does seem to actually care about the way everything tastes, and it it's usually melds very well together. I haven't had any misstep yet. There's a lot of argument about his Burley Morning Pie being good or bad. I've seen mixed reviews mm-hmm. on it. So we're going to see what he does with the chocolate. Is that like a play on early morning pipe? Early yes, morning? I think so. Yeah. That's, a, that's pretty cool. I like his names to his uh, his different He's stuff. definitely clever. Yeah. But the cool thing about him is, is like a clever play on, you know, a blend name doesn't affect the blend with him, which has been yeah. cool. Yeah. So he could be as clever as he wants to be or is not clever. He could just call it, he could literally list it as numbers. And I'd still buy his tobacco. Mm-hmm. You know, if his, you know, tobacco was, you know, L A double Z nine eight four seven or something like that, mm-hmm. I'd still get it. Mm-hmm. Ken Byron's number seven or something like that. Right. Which I think we're gonna roll over into. What? Do, we're gonna smoke another bowl. What is it? Is it the Blink Gallery? We're going to smoke Blair Gowry eventually. I'm probably going to switch because I'm getting kind of low on this one because we were already smoking kind of before we started. Mm-hmm. And it's getting to that phase where I'm not a particular fan of it. <laughs> getting to, yeah. It's like the bottom of a beer. Uh, but I brought Blair Gowry because I knew that this was going to happen. And uh, mm-hmm. I probably feel like changing over. Well, I'll probably change up here in a minute with you. So... Because of that, we're going to go ahead and take a little time to alert you that if you've enjoyed this episode so far, I can't guarantee that you'll continue to enjoy it. Um, This may be a moment, well, this is a little hard to, in this climate, it's hard to talk about this. Let me just tell you this. If you start, we're going to take an intermission. We're going to change out some pipe. We're going to get resituated here. We, we, We wanted to make sure you got what you come here for. Which is pipes and tobacco. Yeah. Which, by the way, I'm smoking this in a Bulldog Sassini, which is a great pipe. I think any Rhodesian oh, Bulldog ends up being... I bet it's actually funny because I'm going to switch to a Rhodesian pipe, but my my Sassini Bulldog has really stood up to all my aromatic blends. And I, I can't help but love a quarter-bent Rhodesian mm-hmm. or Sassini. Because I got two quarter-bent uh, Bulldog... I said Sassini. This Bulldog Sassini and the uh, quarter-bent... Uh, Rhodesian uh, Kaviki mm. pipe that I have. I love those pipes. They're good. They're they're they're, they're, nice. they're the quintessential Zach pipe. Yeah. Like, I prefer a Rhodesian 
or a, a bulldog. I prefer the Rhodesian actually to the bulldog. Yeah. I think to me, I think a Rhodesian is like one of the. It's my preferred shape. Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're both very beautiful. Pipes. I know there's some weird argument in the community about you know if I were to point if I were to put these together you know in pictures and tell people to pick which is a Rhodesian and which is the bulldog, that would have like a million different answers. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I stand by the fact that a bulldog is a diamond shank uh, and a Rhodesian is a rounded shank. Okay, so okay. that's what I stand behind. I mean, I'm but sure the, someone will argue with me that that's not the case. But the way I look at it is not only did I look at like an old catalog where it actually defined the shapes and the diamond shank was the bulldog. But also uh, it makes sense because what do you think of on a dog but like uh, kind of a canine tooth? Yeah. And to me, the diamond shank has that pointed toothy. That's the way I think of it, though. That makes sense. That makes sense. And um, I'm an old, old uh, faithful, the, uh, the Boswell nose warmer of 2019. Uh, That's, that pipe served you well. Yeah, oh yeah. And also known in these parts as Chody Boy. Chody Boy. Chody Boy. Um, but, oh, yeah, so we wanted to give you what you came here for. But we also need to service our vice, which is to just talk. And uh, because of, you know, recent events, there was an election. I don't know if you knew that, Zay. There was an election. <laughs> I wasn't aware. Um, and uh, some will say it's not over. <laughs> um, but we want to talk about that. We want Not necessarily the election, but we want to talk about just the world. What yeah, is going on? The climate on of the, the country, the yeah. climate of, like, global... Not like the most versed, but we also want to give you guys an opportunity to get out. Yeah, it, because I'm one of the kind of guys, I, I don't know if y'all are like this, but like a lot of times when I'm watching other content creators, I, I, want, to, I want them to stay in their own lane. But I also, you know, feel like they have the right to, be, you know, tell what they want to tell. You know, mm -hmm. if, they have a, if they have an opinion they want to get out there, it's their content they're creating. They need to live with that fact. But I know some people... I know with me, you know, sometimes if somebody gets into it, I'm like, I don't really want to hear it right now. I want to escape from it. I don't want to hear it. Um, but, yeah, so we want to leave this up to where, hey, if you don't want to hear that from us, if you don't want us to get into that kind of stuff, you stop listening now, come back next month. This is a good opportunity to kind of get it off our chest. Like We've already ran through every family member who would want to talk about it and stuff and i guess it's sort of uh, the problem with thanksgiving is is that thanksgiving every four years sort of becomes this weird political thing where yeah. everyone has an opinion and you just sort of have to kind of engage in that if you have a legitimate ability to do that some people yeah. can't do it and they freak out you yeah know? well you I know back mad. back in the day it used to be like you don't talk about that you, you know you, Back in the day, you didn't talk about anything that could be controversial. But now everything is controversial. Football is controversial now. Well, the funny thing is, is like my family doesn't talk about politics. Really? We played wiffle ball. That's yeah. what we do. We eat and we talk smack to each other. Mm. And then we take all that aggression and play wiffle ball mm. in the yard. And then we all go home. But we play like, I mean, it's kind of, it sucks. I'm not going to lie. There's something to be said for playing wiffle ball on a on a like an extended stomach you know or distended whatever it is like you know but it sort of gets out all that kind of craziness and that's what we do we sort of we all rally behind wiffle ball you know talking smack playing wiffle ball and we discuss uh, we discuss a lot of movies we're like movie people mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then how's the family and stuff? I don't think I've actually ever, and like, that's what blew my mind is when people talked about, yeah, you know, such and such comes around and talks about politics. You're like, oh. and it's almost a myth to me. I'm like, really? That happens? Wow. Like, I don't think we've ever discussed religion or politics. I talked about the closest thing I got to talking about religion uh, during Thanksgiving was astrology. I talked about astrology for a long time because of uh, people buying and selling different types of. You know, moonstones and earth stones. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, like, the astrological stuff that goes along with it. It wasn't even an argument. We were just saying, like, this stone means this. This stone means that. This birth sign means this. No one said that's wrong. No one said it was right. They were just sort of matter of fact about it. And then they're like, wiffle ball. So why not play wiffle ball? <laughs> I feel like a lot of people hearing that now are jealous of your Thanksgiving. <laughs> really? Yeah. 
if you want to have a fun Thanksgiving, get a wiffle ball set and then just say, all right, we're going to play wiffle ball. And it's weird because everyone seems to want to play it. It's uh, it's pretty fun. Yeah, that sounds like a good a good uh, tradition to have. It's the weirdest tradition. I didn't like. I like. Uh, it, it's funny when because like a wiffle ball, if you guys don't know, will take a dive or it, it's it's easy to curve. It does really weird stuff, and. Uh, I have whiffed so many swings, like, where it's like, <laughs> good lord, like, <laughs> Bunyan, what are you trying to chop down there? Like, you know, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> like, you, my, my dad was standing behind me, and I missed one. I think I missed it so hard, the Hulk couldn't have swung as hard as I swung. And he goes, my dad was like, good lord, I think my, he goes, my hat was straight when you swung, when you, before you swung. And I turned around, and he looked like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> He's like, there's so much wind coming off that bat. <laughs> You can, it's funny is like you, when you think you crushed one, mm -hmm. it goes up, up, up. Oh, it's a grand slam, and it just floats right back to someone's hands. And you're like, "What is this?" <laughs> Wiffle ball. Next Wiffle year, ball. y'all know how to do it. That's your escape. I like uh, Patrick said, we're gonna take a yeah. quick little intermission. We're gonna pack up for Blair Gallery, and then we're gonna talk about the the climate. So if you the climate of the country and <laughs> the world. If you don't want to listen, we do appreciate you listening to this tobacco. Check out Thanksgiving Day if they're still blending it right now. Yep. Or any of the good <clears throat> offerings by LJ Peretti. And I would also say if you want to get your fix and you haven't listened to last year's Thanksgiving podcast, we go a little bit more in depth in the history of Thanksgiving. That's true. So okay. if you want to go so back. this is a good one to go back and kind of yeah. listen to the history of Thanksgiving. I think we even talked about cannibalism in James. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Anytime that we're going to get into the history of something we're gonna find the weird yeah it, it yeah it's in it's inevitable but um but yeah so hopefully we'll see you in a few seconds we're back el politico hmm i don't know i just said el politico i don't even think that's a thing but uh el politico but uh yeah so the world as we know it we're gonna yes. start off. We're gonna start off with the most controversial thing: masks. I'm gonna <laughs> start with masks. <laughs> <I'm kidding>. Okay. <laughs> I think they're. I mean, I think they, they they serve a purpose, but I don't think you need one to go jogging. No, not that's at all. that's sort of dumb. Uh, yeah, I mean, from what I gather, people aren't even convinced that the masks being worn do anything. Well. It all depends on the perspective of, right? So if you are sick or like, you know, say you don't know if you're sick, right? And someone and you're around someone, I think it, it it's, has been proven that it does help transfer from you to them, but it does not help keeping you safe. Mm. They're definitely not supposed to be worn to keep you safe. But I think that's the reason people are wearing them. They think that it, yeah, inadvertently keeps them safe. Some people, yeah, I think the vast majority of people think that. Which I've never thought that. Like before the before the pandemic, like I saw people wearing them. Like that's not helping you. Like that's just making things worse, kind of, because you're keeping all your own crap. The the one the big ones, you know, the ones that have the vent on them, the N95s. Those are the worst ones for COVID mm -hmm. because you're letting air in. Like you might as well not be wearing a mask. <clears throat> yeah, I mean that came out. And people were then people started making it illegal to wear vented masks in certain places. Really? Look, like. Yeah, like that's how me and Ann's been the whole time. It's like, look, we're, we wear a mask when we go, uh, like if we're going in public where we're going inside of a store. So if we're going to the grocery store or we're going, you know, in an office to, I don't know, I don't know, whatever. We, we bought a house during the middle of all this. So like when we were at the closing, like we're going to wear a mask here, but it's not for our benefit. We're young. If we get it, we get it. Who cares? Uh, knock on wood, we haven't. But, um, but, it's not to keep, yeah, it's to keep other people, you know, that's from our perspective. But if we're going hiking or we're going at a park, we're not going to wear no dumbass mask. I only wear it just because I don't feel like rocking the boat or getting into a confrontation <laughs> yeah. with someone that I don't really want to speak to anyway. Like, it, half the time I do things just because I don't want to be spoken to. Exactly, like, um, it, 
not wearing a mask is like wearing a MAGA hat. You're like, I, this is irrelevant to your political opinion, but I feel like anytime you wear a political hat or political clothing article, any kind of clothing article that is divisive in any way, you're asking for a, a con, you know a, a, a conversation. Like it even extends into like. I know you, you're not a, a, a sports guy, but like I half the time I struggle with should I wear so like I you know, I'm an Alabama fan, which living in Alabama is not that controversial to do, but I don't even care like I don't wanna hear people walk up to me and say roll tide, like leave me alone. So like, I'll <laughs> right. purposely not wear it. It does the seem hat. like you're you're inviting some of that stuff. Exactly. I'm a Giants fan, a New York Giants fan. So in you know, the last couple of years People have taken this huge stance against the NFL, all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to hear your opinion. I wore, so there's a minor league baseball team in our area. It's a new one. The Rocket City Trash Pandas. Okay. Which I like the name. I voted for the name. I thought it was better than all the other options. Um, but I was wearing a hoodie that said that at a place. And this woman looks at me and goes, I ain't going to support them. I hate that. I'm like, I can't believe they did that. I'm like. So I'm wearing the Wait, shirt. Wait, can't believe they did what? They named it that. There, there's what? these there's these older generation of people who think naming them trash pandas was like the worst thing you could have ever done. Like I, think, I don't think it's a good name in particular. I like space chips better. Yeah, because, but from marketing per se, I with, think it makes more sense in a marketing perspective. I guess because of the internet. Well. Trash Pandas really works. No idea. Trash Pandas works better. So it's the Rocket City Trash Pandas, and Marvel Rocket Raccoon. He was called. He's a. He is a raccoon. He was called Trash Panda in a movie. They were try, trying to tie it up into that. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I just like the historical nature yeah. of. Yeah. Like you know, we use chimpanzees. I forgot about Space Jam. That's for the only one I liked. Yeah, yeah. that one wasn't bad because there was someone like Thunder Sharks and just all this yeah. garbage. Yeah. And then. I remember the, the argument that got brought to my attention was someone said, uh, well, space chimps can be perceived as racist. And I was like, and Coon can't. <laughs> like, I was exactly. like, that seems like something that I've heard, like, that has been considered a racist thing yeah. forever. Oh, yeah. Forever. I was like, I was like, I don't know, man. It feels like you're reaching because I had to reach for that. I don't feel like either one of them. I just thought that using space chimpanzees was cool because we used them in those early rocket yeah. uh, tests for outer orbital yeah. like rocketry right yeah. yeah i remember thinking that was a bizarre thing i remember when i heard that i was like am i like just oblivious like i could not i still to this day don't i was like man like are you are they or are you reaching for this or am i just so oblivious to it that i don't yeah. understand it because i was like really people are going to go for that people but, are going to say that but how can you be oblivious to that but then they be oblivious to the coon part yeah. of it all you know what i'm saying like it's like it's it's like selective now, granted, they're not going to say trash you know yeah coons. they're, they're not going to say raccoons like, but i'm just saying like doesn't that seem like that's in the same it, thing it's, it's the not same like leap. they're saying they're not saying it's the yeah. same thing they're not saying like chimp pansy you know ergo racism and they're not saying raccoon ergo racism yeah. they're just it's just the animal yeah just one has historical context to the way we tried the Respect, rockets yeah. yeah versus one being in it. i get the marketing aspect yeah like i'm behind it like yeah. it's like raccoon marvel etc it, it I just right don't. Now. I didn't understand the leap that they were making. I was like, just say it's a better. I was like, really? That's where you're going with that? Yeah, like, race. Yeah, yeah. Either way, getting back to it, the because I mean, I get the Indian, I get red skin, I get yeah. Well, I mean, I I at least can like come yeah. to terms with it's like, well, that's about as. I mean, if you're going to go there, that's where it goes. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that it's yeah. right or wrong. That's not the yeah. argument. Yeah. It's like, but at least I can get there yeah you can yeah i don't there's, an there's not a lot made. of leaps yes. to get to that one but like the leaps that you have to make to say that like a mascot that's an animal yeah was surprising i was like man i must be really oblivious yeah. to this but we'll get we'll sort of get back into <laughs> we're gonna get back to that ob oblivious stuff thing too 
like I said, that woman told me that. I'm like, so you're telling me. I obviously like it because I'm wearing the apparel. And you felt the need to tell me you didn't like it? Like, why? What did you think to accomplish from this? You know what I'm saying? And that's an interesting thing, too, because it's a, it's a statistical fact that people who have bumper stickers on their cars yeah. incur more tickets based on inherent biases and in people. Mm. So it's actually better not to have a political or any type of bumper sticker because it causes attention, which puts you on a radar that you probably don't want to be on if you're speeding or not speeding. It just puts you on that radar. Yeah. Yeah, so... Wait, how did we even get to the... Oh, yeah, we, we said not wearing a mask in public is like wearing a MAGA hat. Yeah. You're just inviting someone to say something. So it's like, it's just easier just to go with Just the to flow. go with the flow, because I don't want to. I, I, you know, we live in the South in Alabama, and I can tell you right now, uh, I am more comfortable walking in a line next to someone uh, who has an uh, open carry like firearm strapped to them mm -hmm. in a gas station or wherever there's a lot of open carry here and i'm so used to that i'm so comfortable with that i'm more comfortable with that than going into a whole foods where they have like the mass plus the plastic surgical shield <laughs> and some like hazmat yeah. suit that makes me uncomfortable for some reason but the firearm on your side i guess like it just is kind of humorous but like i went into a whole foods and i was like you guys are prepared for like plague level yeah like it was so much more intense and i was like i just want some granola <laughs> you know i didn't know that like uh you know everyone was going to have the like the, it it was to a point where it's like you know when you go into a hazmated like real biological hazardous area i mean yeah. they tape everything up and so it was like you're like a stone's throw away from taping up your garments <laughs> and i remember being really uncomfortable with that because it felt like Sometimes when I see reality be interpreted a certain way, yeah. it makes me re-examine how it is. Mm. So when I see stuff like that, I'm like, is Corona more dangerous than I know? Like, yeah. and then I go research more and I'm like, oh, no, it's not. These people are just overly cautious. And then I get paranoid because they're so, like, above and beyond the call of duty for a mask. It's like, I got the shield, I got the mask, I got the goggles, I got the tape, I got the... I'm like, good lord. Yeah, I mean... And again, it is relative to, like, your age, right? So, like... if I'm not saying don't wear a mask yeah, either. Yeah, I'm just but saying, the paranoia, like, the paranoia to me, like, I think it's heightened because you see these people who are over... Like, 20-year-olds overreacting. And they get, yeah. like, all this info, all the stuff on... And then I'm like, oh, that's, should I be wearing that much uh, paraphernalia for, or garments or something to keep me, you know, yeah. it just seems crazy. Yeah. Uh, it is crazy. Sort of segueing back to you talking about open carry. I was telling uh, Ann this morning, I, wish I, I probably brought it up to you before. So in, in Alabama, is one of the open carry states, but then you need a concealed carry permit to conceal carry. And I don't know, maybe I'm in the minority here, but like, I think it should be the other way around. Like, I don't care. I don't want to know if you have a gun. If you got a gun, fine. I don't care if you got it. But like, open carrying it sort of, to me, invites not confrontation, but over anxiety, kind of, in my opinion. Like, if I walked into a church's chicken, right, right. or Bojangles, and there's a guy there, which most people who are going to open carry, not trying to be, not trying to racial profile, but it's going to be some white redneck kind of guy, at least from my opinion. <laughs> the only people I've ever seen open carry are, like, like white dudes Big belt in muscles. overalls. Which, that's the crazy part about open carry to me, because, like, I hate belts. So I can't imagine putting some other crap on my pants. Like, <laughs> I already don't like yeah. the thing that keeps my pants up, technically. But then to wear but something. But then to wear something that weighs it down, eh, that'd be so obnoxious. But, like, to me, like I said. Open or concealed. I couldn't do it. But, like, to conceal, like, to me, it's like, it's one of those things where it's, like, out of out of sight out of mind kind of thing like mm -hmm. whether you had a gun or not i don't care it doesn't bother me now it's just when you openly show it it's like are you looking for a fight kind of are you looking to use this again that i'm probably in the minority at least in the area that we live but i don't see open carry enough for it to bother me 
and again, I don't care if you do it or not. I'm just saying if you're comparing the two, open to conceal, I would rather not care. I would rather not know. I guess the thing with conceal is like the clandestine nature of having a weapon on you. Yeah. Like you need to, it. people need to know that you have the, I guess maybe there needs to be some something on the books that says like, yeah, this guy could be weaponed or not. Maybe. Yeah. And maybe it's a law enforcement thing. Because if you yeah. got open carry, it's not like they're not going to be able to identify that in the yeah. first second of seeing you. I don't what? think I've ever not seen... I've never not noticed an open carry. Yeah, It's exactly. the first thing that I notice if, when you've if got you a gun If you see it, you see it. We went to a church over there south of where you live, and um, we walked in, and the guy in front of us, open carry, first thing I noticed, mm -hmm. was like, what the heck? Well, I, I thought... Man, are we gonna are, are we gonna relive Kingsman over here? Yeah, I mean it's it is what it is. It just I like you're not gonna catch me like conceal or open really, just because I don't like a bunch of extra crap on me. Well, and uh, this is a very flawed argument, but it helps me sleep at night. It's like, look, I made it. I didn't say having a gun wasn't a thing, not an option. I'm just saying like I'm not gonna carry a gun on. Yeah, me. I live in a place. I know exactly. If you have to have, if you are concerned about the areas that you're going in and you need a gun, you should move. Well, I mean, the odds are like, you know, it's just, I've gotten this it's, far. It's, it, it, it's peculiar. Like, I just know where to go and where not to go. You know, you got enough and it's social just like, yeah, you know, I get it if it's a work thing, but like, I find that contractors and stuff are not permitted to carry on site or on the job so it's just like now what are you gonna do you know the company forbids you from having a weapon to the point that if you fire a weapon or you're carrying a weapon you're caught you're fired from your job oh wow you know so maybe you know that's like a rock and a hard place where it's like if you're concerned for your safety and you're not allowed to carry what do you do you know yeah you take the risk and chance getting fired or do you take the risk of getting if it's a seriously bad area getting hurt in the process i don't know i guess it just depends which is more important your life or the money or the money or your life yeah which you mean if you ain't got your life the money don't matter but, but that's that's a that's kind of a risk reward scenario too yeah you know i mean like i worked in afghanistan and it's not that my life didn't matter but the survival of you know working there meant that I wouldn't have this amount of debt because I was going to get paid a certain amount of money. Provide for your family. Right. So it's not that, you know, and the same thing can be said for a contractor. It's like, well, do you want to take the risk of getting killed while at the same time being able to provide or do you not? It's a weird question. Yeah. I guess like, it's just strange that companies forbid it because it's like, really, can you infringe on their constitutional right, I guess, to bear arms or, or their state right to open carry yeah i mean it, you could take that argument into i guess states where marijuana is legal right it's right. legal to do it but a company could still drug test you and fire you yeah because it's not legal on a federal level yeah so it's like there's so many situations well okay we're getting a little sidetracked um i mean we're, we're in the same vein but we're getting a little bit off topic here <laughs> the funny thing is i mean i like you literally are like, let's talk about some stuff that people are arguing about right now. And I haven't had one mass slash open carry conversation yet. So we're in like uncharted territory for me because I, <laughs> I never talk. About, I don't talk about these two issues because it doesn't seem these seem like non issues. Anytime I hear someone, the irony is, is people who complain about masks typically open carry. <laughs> <laughs> we really went went there and, and and the mask was sort of a, a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing mm -hmm. like it's really not that important I'm, okay, well, okay hold on it's important to some people but what i'm getting at is in the grand scheme of the, the thing other things we're going to talk about it's not that important mm -hmm. kind of the real big thing is just people like what is happening in the world and the way people react and people have lost their collective minds and i'll give you a great example of that that I think is that um, in the last couple of weeks since the election, I found out that 95 to 98 percent of the United States population are hypocrites. Okay. 
Because four years ago, they complained about voter fraud on the left. Yeah, outside the... And they said there's no way, the right said there's no way that could happen ever. Yeah. Fast forward four years, and now all the right says it's voter fraud, and the left says there's no way that could happen. So, (laughs) you're both hypocrites. (laughs) Like, because you can't just do that 180 like that. Either you... So the left right now should say we should investigate to the full extent of the law to see if it's voter fraud. Yeah. And the right should be like... It's probably not voter fraud. We should just let the election ride. But it's not what's happening. And that is hypocrisy. Yeah, I mean, and, and <laughs> what you just said has applied to so many things the last mm-hmm. decade, right? Um, with the, you know, the Amy Coney Barrett situation, mm-hmm. right? You know, McC- you know, McConnell had set the precedent that we're not going to do this in election year. But that was stupid to begin with. So I've heard people say, well, he should, he should own on to it. You know, he should hold to that. Like, but you didn't want him to then. So your opinion has now changed. His opinion has changed, which is wrong. Which is wrong. And you want your opinion changed too. So if your opinion changes, depending upon if somebody has an R or D next to their name, mm-hmm. then you're just following orders. I mean, See, that's the thing. It's like people don't really think outside of their team and the team dynamic and the, and you know to kind of relate that to a sports the team dynamic and what team you're on is really setting the stage for all political opinion and that's what's yeah. bumming me out especially when i talk to people who definitely lean right or left because i'm in the i'm in the camp of like yo both of the parties are terrible right and they're like yeah but the democrats aren't that bad i mean they're really for the people or then the Republican would say, well, yeah, the Republicans aren't really, I mean, between the two, the Republican really isn't that bad. And I'm like, mm, no, they're both god-awful <laughs> organizations that yeah. need to be eradicated. I was like, if they were so good and they were so for the people, then both parties could come to terms with things that are universally accepted as good. Congressional term limits would be one. I mean, like that right there, no rider bills, you know? It's yeah. like, if I don't want... Uh, oak trees in the United States, right? Mm-hmm. Then I write a bill that says we're going to cut down all oak trees and destroy that thing. You're not going to write, we're going to cut down all oak trees. Also, we're going to make sure veterans get funded. Like, it's like, no, yeah. you either you fund the veterans separately and you fund the oak tree no separate. There should be no rider on that. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Lobby, lobby, lobbyists. Mm-hmm. People know that that's a problem. Yeah. But they can't agree to... Right. Be- it's because you were talking about the team dynamic or the team aspect of your side. That only applies to the people who are voting. The people who are up there, the team, the actual, mm-hmm. the, the people that are on the field playing, they know that they're working together to f- to keep their... Mm. It, it's, it, but it's, that's what bugs me about sports and self, yeah. sports and politics. These, these things like seem to roll into each other in the United States so heavily. Like... Um, especially because oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to hit some Alabama fans like that. But uh, hey, you know, I, I'm an exception. It's not like a a knock necessarily, but I'm so used to hearing it from Alabama fans. They're like, "Yeah, man, we won last night." I was like, "You won." Yeah, you won. you were on that field. <laughs> no, you didn't. Like your team won. I get it, but they're not really playing for you. You get no benefit from them winning technically, outside of being like, "We won." Yeah, and that's the way I feel about politics. It's like. We won. It's like, no, you didn't. No. Like, you can look across the board and see that you clearly didn't win. Yeah. Like, it's an issue. Like, it's an issue because they seem to be doing exactly what's in their self-interest. Which yeah. isn't in line with your interests. And, again, they're working together so they can both... There's there's no division between Republicans and Democrats. It's one entity called politics right it's the political machine yes and it is rolling the funny thing is is like my buddy actually brought it to my attention i don't respect all his opinions not really any to be honest with you but he did say this and it caught my attention one time he goes you know you vote for democrat or republican but they still go to lunch together in dc and i was like geez i never really (laughs) thought of it like that yeah (laughs) yeah i mean he's like how are they gonna have lunch together if they're so against each other Exactly. That's what I'm saying. The, the the polarization is all the people who vote. It's the it is 
it is represented from those people, the, the players. They are pushing it, and the, the media then pushes it, creates more division. But the players themselves, they're in it together. They're, you know, they're, they're bumping each other, saying, hey, we, you know, we did good the other day, you know. Mm-hmm. We did, like, it's, and, and it just, it upsets me. I shouldn't get this upset about it, but it's just that nobody sees it. Nobody cares. Well, it does see seem it. like politics has become this giant theatrical piece. I fully think I, people will tell me that I'm probably a conspiracy theorist, but I fully think everything that's happened this last month, everybody knew that it was ha- going to happen before it happened. Like, like even Trump, all the players that were involved knew exactly how this was going to play out, and it was part of it. We're going to pull this election longer. It creates more airtime for the for the uh, the news people, which creates more advertisement, which does all this, which means more people are getting paid. All of this, the Trump not succeeding, the voter fraud, it was all part of the plan. Well, the interesting thing about that is, is like if I'm going to tiptoe into, and now let me say this something. I think that every political party has or left or right they have their shortcomings you know yeah um and i'll say this because it's easy to say right now i think the right is struggling with conspiratorial uh or conspiracy like you know theories Mm -hmm. Uh, i i think that that is a problem with the right right now is they sort of are really susceptible to conspiracy theories which is super ironic because the left used to be the most notorious for it yeah you know i remember thinking like I swear to God, like, you know, when the the last election happened and, you know, people were saying, well, the CIA says that, you know, the left was saying this. The CIA says that, that you know, there could be a potential for Russian interference. And I was like, you believe the CIA now? When did that happen? <laughs> like, like, aren't you guys like anti, like, <clears throat> G-men and all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Like, that was like the whole upbringing was that there was a, a certain amount of distrust from the left of the government and then now it seems like they throw their lots in with them but i think the right is encountering that to a certain degree now which i'll get into why that's a super bad thing in a second but you know everyone has their like shortcoming yeah. you know i think the left is so Categorize like they have so many subcategories and subgenres in their own political movement that they can't unify under one thing. Yeah, the only thing they were able to unify under in this election election is that they didn't like Trump. As a one unifying thing, there were bumper stickers that I saw that said, "Uh, it was um, settle for Biden, settle." Like <laughs> that seems like the most. I I couldn't even believe someone put that on their car. Yeah, I was like, man, what a lukewarm reception to the most like settle for like, it i saw one that said anyone but trump which is still better than settle for so biden settle for biden i couldn't believe it i was like man really pushing that candidate aren't you <laughs> but like uh <laughs> you know so the um uh, oh, we're saying something conspiracy oh that leads into that conspiracy that you were talking about like everyone do sort of leads into the last four years because everyone sort of discombobulated a little bit from i think the last couple of elections but trump winning actually changed my worldview for a hot minute and i had to contend with that yeah um because i do not believe that your vote matters (laughs) and i don't Uh, believe in democracy to a certain extent then trump won and i was like maybe your vote does matter maybe elections are real that blew my mind like because there is there's no way he should have won no. As a matter of fact, I still think that he just ran as a publicity stunt and then won incidentally. Yeah, he really didn't want it. So if you're saying that everyone knew, yeah, everyone knew, and Trump was in on it because I don't think he wanted to be president in the first place. Yeah. And that might be controversial to some people, but, and I know why he won to a certain extent. Like, his message was pretty much, it was aimed towards, you know, kind of a blue collar working class mm-hmm. like let's kind of like get things back to like a halcyon day kind of message which is pretty you know people were getting kind of frustrated with that i was like that seems like pretty straightforward political rhetoric yeah. you know yeah didn't seem like too crazy to me like no. it was like everyone kind of says like let's make it good again like the last guy sucked you know yeah um everyone's kind of had that message you know i mean that's what obama ran on against after the bush 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. He 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 ran on change. Yeah. You know, like and and not cha- changing away from and like kind of getting back to a better yeah system. He's a you know he was sort of a neoliberal like he didn't really change much of anything. As a matter of fact, you it could be argued that he sort of kind of ran in in a geopolitical sense. He definitely continued on what the Bush administration did with drone strikes and everything, yeah. you know? He didn't, he seemed kind of like lukewarm to me. He didn't really do much of anything. He he tackled more the domestic pressing things, that socially things that people, people on the left wanted. Which could be argued that it actually exacerbated the situation to Probably, a certain extent. Yeah. They, some people say that like some things actually got worse because of the way he sort of it's Justin, the, and then the geopolitical realm he yeah. left up to Clinton. Yeah. I mean, that the Arab Spring in Syria was so botched. Yeah. I did not want us to get involved with that. I couldn't believe McCain wanted to get into that. Like, you know, because he was pro... Oh, whatever. And that's a stupid story, but I don't like... I didn't like that whole yeah. situation. And then we had, like, factions fighting against each other, basically, like, that we were sponsoring. What is that? Like, yeah. What is that? Like, I, I've... I used to be a super like isolationist, but I, I sort of, with everything, I have grown to understand that there are complexities to the world, and you know, um, you can't just be. There shouldn't labels should not exist. <laughs> let me just let me just say that. But but what I would say is I do enjoy. I enjoyed Trump's foreign policy. I felt like it was enough of we're going to focus on us, but we're also going to. You know, make sure we don't get stepped on kind of situation. Like, I, I didn't really mind his foreign policy. He did enough. Like, you know, it's it's hard to be like, because a lot of people, because usually when I, I'm not a Trump fan, really. Um, but there is no way that anyone can, you can't, if you guys ever get into an argument with someone you, and you want it to be relatively fair, yeah. Right. If you're if you're a moderate, if you consider yourself a moderate, which I sort of consider myself a moderate, that there's no true side, there's no absolute side that's that's right. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah. But if you ever want to get into an argument with somebody, or if you're ever kind of in a situation where they want to argue with you, let's say your candidate is Trump, this will be easier. Before they are, did you allow them to say anything to you? Make them say at least three good things about that candidate. Or whoever it is that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Because there's no absolute evil person. No. And, uh, I mean, Trump shaking hands with the North Korean leader is unprecedented. Yeah. That has never been done. Like, that is crazy. And, and people discount that like it was nothing. That is a yeah. huge deal. Like, they yeah. literally shook hands. Like... To get to that level where you're actually in talks with someone who has been vilified for sure since the Bush administration. I mean, before that, of course, North Korea has always had their little hangups or whatever. But, like, to get to a point where, like, you're kind of sitting at the table with them, which it literally happened. Yeah. That's impressive. Trump should be applauded for that. That's a good thing. Yeah. I can say good things about a lot of candidates, you know, because they're not uniformly bad, Mm -hmm. you know? That, I think, uh, like Biden, for instance, there should be more to, or more regulation to fracking, too. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. I think you can look into that more, and that'd be something that you look into. Uh, I could go on. I don't want to go on because it kind of derails, but there is no one-sidedness. If you no. feel like there's a one-sided nature to it, maybe you're not nuanced enough and you should reinvestigate but if you ever do get into a situation where you're stuck trying to defend a candidate make that person say something nice now granted you'll probably have to say something nice about their candidate but the stuff's on the books yeah I'm, it's very yeah. rare that you find someone who's just absolutely awful yeah I mean yeah like what's so crazy about it is like Biden himself I mean he doesn't seem like a bad guy you know like uh, when he was leaving, like at, when Obama's term was ending, they, there was something he did where it's one day, a special day when like all the Congress people bring their families up and then like they talk. I don't, I can't remember exactly what the whole thing was, but I, I read an article or heard a, a radio article on um, 
how you know Biden really enjoyed that those moments, the the politics of it all, the the you know shaking hands and meeting and greeting, and he genuinely liked that. And I'm like, well, he, he seems like a genuinely nice guy. The problem that I have, and again, if you take a step back and look at it as all one machine, it's really not that bad of a problem. You just have to deal with it. But to me, like look at it this way, right? So for the last you know, ever since the pandemic started, there's always been criticism that Trump didn't handle it the right way, right? Right. And then, you know, you know, Biden was sold on the fact that his way would be better. And then, you know, you hear people on the left. I, I don't mean to keep dogging the left. It's just examples here. Um, but, you know, they're like, you know, they, they looked at it where we're trying to do what's right for the people. We're trying to save lives. If you really, if Biden really was about saving lives... And why didn't he just present his plan and offer it up for, you know, he just said, we should do this, this and this and say, plead the, with Trump. To, Let's do these things. But no, we didn't hear anything of what he wanted to do. Maybe a little bit of it until after the, you know. Well, it's questionable whether or not they had a plan to begin with, I, yeah. I suppose, is the case that could be made. Once again, I'm going to refer back to this. While the right has a, a huge issue mm -hmm. with conspiracy yeah. theory. Yeah. You know, the left has this, like I said, I think the subcategorization of the left and like kind of the sub subgenres of people who are, you know, like uh, neo-lib, you know, traditionally liberal or like some would even say Dixiecrat to a certain extent. Mm. That, that's something that's still pervasive in the South. Um, At least in local. And then you local. have sort of extreme social kind of uh social liberals and yeah. and then you have like socialists like so like literal they call themselves what is it like socialist democrat uh, socialist yeah yeah i think it's socialist democrat or social you have that yeah i mean they have a lot of stuff that's really difficult to unify on and while i'll say that like um so what i was getting at there is that um, the republicans because of their conspiratorial kind of nature right now like i don't like the idea that they're like well you know Biden's a pedophile. It's like, well, no, he probably isn't. Yeah. He not. really isn't. You know, I don't get that. I don't get that. He's just an old man. <laughs> he's just older. I mean, like, I don't think, I think maybe his handler should probably be like, hey, you know, just pat the kid on the head. Yeah. You know, it comes across kind of creepy because, you know, there was that whole Pizzagate conspiracy. And then, of course, like the Lolita Express. And like, you shouldn't be kissing kids post um was that guy that killed himself why uh epstein epstein anything post epstein post cosby don't just keep your hands to yourself keep Wait, your lips he killed himself epstein epstein 100 that's not a conspiracy theory or it is a conspiracy that there was a group of people who like the Epstein, like, look, you guys can say whatever you want. That is not a conspiracy. He killed, he did not kill himself. Yeah. He was murdered. Yeah. I don't know why he was murdered. I mean, I have an idea, but like, he was murdered. There is no way that he was, the the guy who is a professional skeptic who, who runs that skeptic magazine. Yeah. A professional skeptic literally walks into every situation not believing what is, you know, the kind of theory on, he looked at all the evidence the missing camera footage, like the cop, the, the, was it like the ligatures or whatever on the neck where mm -hmm. there's no way it could be, you know, strangulation from rope that he couldn't have hung himself, that it was clearly like his neck was broken by human. He looked at all that stuff and he goes, yes, conspiracy. <laughs> like that's a professional dude. Like who's yeah. like, no, uh, this is, this is kind of nuts. So yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, the dude killed, the, the dude was murdered. He was yeah. murdered. That, that's why you, when you said what was the, you said the guy that killed himself and I was like he killed himself I was just no I'm I was, just telling you like there's no way you can shake me no on that. no 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 but, I, like, I agree the with point you. is is like Biden's handler should be like come on man like we know that there is nothing I think that you're doing that is pedophile like yeah. he, like I don't think he truly that that's no, crazy man no. don't don't that and that's messed up too do not call well, a man a pedophile when he's just like an old sort of traditional this is the way you do it I've seen that stuff done in church and while there are pedophiles and stuff around that want to harm kids and they're politicians I'm sure and, ch and churchgoers I'm sure mm -hmm. I really don't think Biden's a pedophile no. and I think that is that's sort of cruel to say that like you know I think that you can you 
you are better suited if you're going to go after him and attack him personally. You're better suited to say that he has like cognitive yeah. issues, like he's slower on. He's not as sharp as he probably used to be. He's getting up in age. Focus on that stuff. The, the pedophile thing. It's sort of like saying that your 90-year-old grandpa is a pedophile yeah. because he hugged and kissed your baby. It's kind of messed up, in my opinion. However, I do think what you said they should have sort of zeroed in on is probably one of the reasons why Trump lost. Which, yeah. You know, calling him Sleepy Joe. And I don't think that played well with the elderly who would have voted for Trump. You know what Maybe. I'm saying? I, I think he should he should have been more... Uh, I think if Trump wanted a whole, uh, like a slam dunk... I think if he would have pushed for federal legalization of marijuana, that probably if, if he wanted to win, I stand by conspiracy. This is conspiracy, guys. I stand by the fact that he didn't want to win. Well, I also it, stand by that he didn't want to win four years ago. And the reason he won, in my opinion, is because we were ingesting 20 years of reality television. Yeah. To we, the point that, like, we wanted, you know, we wanted someone that was sort of like the heel, the underdog, or someone who was an outsider. You want the person, you're rooting, the American conscience has been so much digestion of reality TV that it, it really has become reality. We want, we want drama, we want chaos. Right, so that's inevitably what, the, there are other factors, you can't just like line it up. The country hated Hillary Clinton. That's a fact. Yeah. I mean, they hated her. If you hated Hillary Clinton or the Clintons in general, you really hated them. Really hated them. And I think the country just said, yeah, we hate Hillary Clinton. And you know what? I've seen American Idol, and it worked out. So, <laughs> Trump. Yeah. I, and I think, too, I think, you're, I think you're hitting on something, you know, I think you're getting real close here. You know, him really not wanting to win in 2016... And if, again, if this conspiracy, you know, I have no nothing to back this up. Uh, it's just something that would be interesting to look into. If everything from 2016 to now has been sort of scripted in a way, at least in terms of s stuff, if if Trump was planted, right, if they all knew how this was going to work out, that, that Hillary was going to beat Bernie, Hillary was going to be the Democratic nominee, um... They needed somebody weak like Trump, you know, somebody who everybody said didn't have a chance to win. Mm -hmm. And Trump knew that, you know, Trump was just there as a publicity stunt. Um, if all that's true, that could explain why him surprisingly winning is why the media and everybody just jumped on. We got to get this guy out. Mm -hmm. We got to do the Russian thing. We got to do the Ukraine thing. We got to do impeachment. Uh, we got to blame the pandemic on him. We. We have got to do everything we can. Everything he ever says, we're going to misquote it. We're going to re recontextualize it. Like, we're going to do everything. We it did look like they were actively working against them. And I also it, think yeah. it was sort of like, uh, I think you've said before in the past that, like, it, there's a hard separation between ego and any one thing. Like, you really can't take ego out of stuff. A lot of yeah. people end up putting a lot of ego into everything they do. Be it mm -hmm. sports, driving a car, whatever, ego kind of gets in it. And I think it bruised the ego that the media was in such a bubble. I mean, like, if you look at how much Clinton was predicted to take this yeah. and then lost. Yeah. I mean, everyone had to kind of reevaluate the way they observe things, their values, talking in a bubble, the vacuums that were created from the Internet. Mm -hmm. The only reason I said Trump was going to win was I had taken a trip up to the Northeast. I went to Connecticut, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, um, Rhode Island. And the amount of Trump signage, like mm. signs in people's yards. Now I'm not talking about like in these battle states where like you see billboards and stuff. I'm talking about personal signs in people's yards was so mind boggling to me. Mm. Cause I couldn't believe it. I was like, people are voting for, they are voting for him in the Northeast. Now, in the South, it's a little bit different story. But when I was in the Northeast and I saw that many people, yeah, like, you know, going for Trump, like, I know I was like, all right, this is going to be a lot more interesting than I thought. Because at the beginning of the election, I go, here we go, 2016, Clinton or Bush again. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be come down between Jeb and Hillary. And then Trump just like, chewed up Bush and spit him out and I remember thinking wow that was really unexpected like I didn't mm. expect that to happen 
Because, I mean, this is the guy who was running on, as a birther in the beginning. He was running on a, as the birther movement. Yeah. Like, you know, Obama wasn't born in the United States, which Obama didn't do anything to help himself. I think he originally registered as a Kenyan citizen to get into Harvard. I'm not saying that's not something people do, but, I mean, that's not really helping your cause any. Yeah. People, I remember people were really upset about that, that people were questioning his him being an actual citizen. And, uh, you know, I said, well, I mean, look at the situation. I mean, like, he sort of, he sort of set himself up to be in that position, you know? Yeah, he... It was, it was peculiar, because it, it really, people, re it really was strange that they were like, I mean, I, I, I didn't disagree that he was a citizen. It doesn't matter anyway, because if you can imagine, like, uh, because people were still pushing it after he got elected and all the way into four years of his, you know, of him being president. And I remember thinking... You know, if you did prove definitively that he wasn't a citizen, I mean, would that negate four years of legislature and spending? I was like, dude, you're talking about crippling a nation. Shut up. Yeah, yeah. You know, not only is the birther movement kind of crazy, but that's the way Trump ran. Trump started out as a birther. He He's the guy who fought Rosie O'Donnell about the uh, beauty pageant thing. To me, this was just a stunt for publicity. So when he won... You know, like I said, I had to kind of reevaluate the way I even felt about democracy. I was like, maybe <laughs> we do have the right to vote. Like, maybe that is something that actually works. Yeah. Because ultimately, the candidates are selected by the party. Yeah. You know, and it's this machine, you know, and it really, you really don't have a stance in it. If you live in Alabama, it's going red. E exactly. So it's like, uh, to me, a vote is just as pointless as anything. It doesn't matter if you vote Democrat, Republican, it third party. I don't really think it means anything. No. Then Trump won, and I was like, maybe her votes do count? That blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's why, I like, there's a multitude of things that we could do probably to help make our vo our voices and our votes count more. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe uh, you could switch it back to congressional districts, but I think that would just even things out. You know, whereas right now, what, California gets 55, you know, blue votes every time. It's guaranteed. 55. Well, one of the things I think that is pretty interesting, Australia does a, like, kind of ranking vote. So, in other uh, words, That's another like, thing I was going to say, yeah. I don't know what it's called. I think it's called preferred choice. Preferred choice. That's a really cool thing where you, you can vote them. for Joe Jorgensen, right? Yeah, yeah. All right? But if she doesn't win, your, your vote, vote gets deferred to Trump or yeah. Biden. I think that's, that's one thing we probably should do. That seems pretty interesting because it seems like it would give a third party an edge. As opposed to people just assuming that they've wasted their vote. Yeah, because yeah, right now a third party, all it does is it like is either a wasted vote or it spoils an election kind of thing. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. Sorry, because I said the right is very conspiratorial. Yeah. You know, which is used to be a traditionally a left thing. Yeah. Right. And now the left is censoring, which I felt was a traditional right thing to do. Yeah. I feel like they they censor more. The reason I say that isn't just like cancel culture and stuff. Um, I find that I've spoken to people when I tell them that I'm not voting and then they said that I'm a problem and that yada, 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 or that I'm wrong for that, mm -hmm. you know, or, uh, if you vote third party, you're essentially trying to elect Trump. I've heard them throw that crap at people. Yeah. Um, I think that that's a problem. I think that level of trying to like bad, bad, and batter, batter people into, or bully people into this kind of thing. Which, ironically to me, was a traditionally right thing. And anybody who's, like, super hardcore Republican and disagrees, I'd say that you need to go back to 2003, 2004, when people were saying that the Iraq war didn't seem legit, and then they immediately got called out for not being a patriot and being specifically anti-American and <laughs> yeah. anti-soldier, anti-military. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, you guys gave birth to what the left is doing. They're, they're taking your tactics and re-manipulating them into their own thing. They're sort of like, yeah, yeah. It's weird that they flipped to me. Well, they flipped even, you were talking about calling Biden a pedophile. That's a playbook. That's a, that's a left playbook. You know, if you want to get, if you want to hurt somebody, an opponent, find somebody to claim that they got raped by them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that that's, not, that's not true in some instances. I'm just saying that seems to happen a lot to Republican candidates. So either they they are rapists pred predominantly, yeah. or like it is a political tactic. It does seem like I, that was one thing that bothered me about some politicians or p political movements is, is like it's a very serious thing for sexual allegations against someone. It's very yes. serious. The victims are hurt. They need justice. That's a fact. Like it's not good rape. Murder, 
pedophilia, all that stuff is terrible, and it's really terrible yeah. for the victim. But the ironic thing, the reason why I don't like it in the political spectrum is because as soon as the election's over, you never hear about it again. Like, who never. has heard anything else about Roy Moore? Who has heard anything else about uh, Kavanaugh? Kevin, yeah. Nothing. Because no one cares because it's a political stunt. So either he really is a convicted or should be a convicted rapist who needs to, to be brought to justice or it's irrelevant. It's just a political stunt. It really yeah. does lessen to me the serious nature of sexual allegations and things that we really should see to the full extent of the law yeah. all the way to the end. But because you're bringing it up in like what is just a, a circus that really the victim gets left behind and it's really more of who's winning this election and not that's shameful it yeah i mean well because someone got hurt yeah and 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 either i'm not, and that's not just the victim either that could literally be the political candidate you know well i would i would say not political by doing it political in political you know reasons that definitely does hurt like your everyday you know, rape charges and, and, and uh, sexual... You're saying uh, it doesn't hurt it? No, wait, no, doing that politically hurts it. It trickles down to every day to where by, by, by every time... Let, let's, let's just say that they are, they are for political gain, right? The, the ones, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the Kavanaugh You're saying one. that they're false allegations yeah. to try to get someone stopped. Yeah. Let's say that, okay. yeah, let's say that's true. If that's true and you're using it every time to hurt a candidate that hurts the real cases that are being brought forth every you know every day whenever it, it happens in everyday life that's not you know just some random person who gets assaulted by another random person you're 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 basically overexposing us to it to where it doesn't it's almost like it doesn't matter anymore you're saying it's it the overexposure desensitizes the public to exactly it. I and, hope that's not the case. And, and then, too, I think... But I think definitely in a political arena, it does that. I yeah. hope not on a local level. Yeah, I hope not either. But but you could see where it could get to that point. I think everything does have an effect. Yeah. And, Especially and, if it's large enough. Yeah. And I wouldn't say this to candidates because a lot of... Especially, like, higher up, like, you know, U.S. Uh, Senate and stuff like that. I would say that... A lot of them are probably already scummy anyway. But to like real, well, I don't like either political party. I don't know how many times I can make that clear before yeah, we go any further. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Like I think what is being done pedophile wise to Biden is not good. It's not good. It's that's the same thing. It's, it's the, the same. same. It's shenanigans. Yeah. It's like do not do that because that's a. He still is like I don't like him. I don't like Trump. So it's whatever. But like as much as I don't like some of the things Biden says, one he's not wrong about everything. Okay. No. no. And two. Like, he's still a person, and that can really damage him. And that's what I was saying. Like, now, granted, there yeah. is an argument to be made that, like, when you get to that level, because I think yeah. all politicians, to a certain extent, are only craving power, that they should be scrutinized to a level that is almost inhumane. Like, because yeah. it's like, you're really sort of leaving behind any type of normalized life when you get into that arena. Yeah. Because these are career politicians. So, you know, maybe mudslinging is just par for the course and they should shut up and just kind of endure, endure it. I do think that for the general public, it doesn't help. Because what the general public does is they can't sort of separate the two. Yeah. It's the reason why I can't listen to anything like uh, Pizzagate. It's a great example. Probably super wrong. It's like child pedophile ring in like the yeah. D.C. area or whatever. Super wrong. But it's difficult for me because I have a really hard soft spot for people who are helpless. So mentally challenged people, children, the elderly, don't mess with those groups mm -mm. because they can't defend themselves. So, like, I'm really susceptible to that kind of stuff where I'm like, you yeah, I want, I want to burn down D.C. because yeah. a child can't protect itself. Yeah. Like, that's – so, but to the point that, like, I would defend Biden because it's like – Come on, man. Like, I've been in the South for so long. Like, I know what old people are like. He's not a pedophile. He's just an old man. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that's bad about that is that, like, his handler should be like, come on, Joe, yeah, yeah. quit. You know? I mean, I have to tell my dad. My dad's a magician. Or he, he's a hobbyist magician. He ties balloons. I know how to tie balloons. I know how to do some magic tricks and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it, I think it's cool. You know, people think it's kind of dumb. 
But uh, <clears throat> I have to explain to my father that you cannot approach children because no one knows who you are. Yeah. And we're in this world now. My dad is like the sweetest, gentlest dude in the whole wide world and loves kids. I trust him with anything. He would, you know, he's loved my wife. I mean, hit my wife. He's loved my mom. They've been married for 40 plus years, you know? Like, he's never going to do anything to endanger or hurt a child. He's like the, I would, he would be the last suspect in any case you ever brought up to me. And not just because he's my father, but because I was raised by him. I've watched him around. I mean, he's, he's just not that person. But I still, as a son, have to explain to him, strange children cannot be approached. <laughs> Like, they just can't. I know you tie balloons. I know you do magic tricks. I know it's fun and fascinating to watch a child, child sort of wonder. Yeah. But you can't do that. And that's the problem with Joe Biden. It's like, who is your handler? Yeah. They should 100% be right there telling you, no, Joe, please stop. It just yeah. doesn't look right. Mm. Well, that's kind of weird. But, I mean, like, I'm defending him because I don't think it's right. <clears throat> well, and that's but then you have the be. other episode, the other side of that coin for a Democrat too. Bill Clinton, how many times did he ride on the Lolita Express with Epstein? And we don't go further into that. Yeah, like there are examples where it's like questionable. Yeah, I think Trump was on the on the Lolita yeah. Express too. Should be investigated. Yeah. Like what in the world? Like if anyone is in that, then they are suspect and they are th there's a problem. Doesn't yeah. mean that they did anything. Doesn't mean Trump did anything. Doesn't mean Bill did anything. But if you're in that, if you were in that arena, yeah. then why isn't that being investigated? People were harmed by that scumbag. You know? I mean, I'm glad he's dead. Yeah. But I think he's dead because there it, it runs a lot deeper. Yeah. They didn't want secrets, you know? Yeah. Names. Sorry, man. The kid thing really does upset me. <laughs> because I don't think I don't Joe yeah. should be subjected to that. I think that's shenanigans. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um... One thing I would say, sort of moving on a little bit, and I don't know how you feel about this, but if you want to, let's just say you want to be involved in, in, in the voting process, yeah. and you, and, you it, well, and I'll tell you this, if you live in a swing state, mm -hmm. you, you do your research and vote for who you want to vote for. Like, uh, you know, I was t telling people that, that I knew that were in a swing state, I might look. If you're a Biden supporter, you get out there and vote. You 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 make your voice heard because you have a, a opportunity that I don't have. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I wouldn't have been out there supporting Biden, but either way, I I, I was told this. So I recently converted um, to Catholicism, um, and I, I was raised Church of Christ, and and luckily enough, the deacon that was in charge of my conversion was a converted Church of Christ. So we sort of had things we could talk about, similar ideas, and, which luckily enough, what I found out was the modern church is very similar to ideas I already had, kind of. You know, it, right. it, I didn't really, I didn't really change my viewpoints, really. Mm -hmm. But what he, it was brought up, what do you tell people who are not part of the church? You know, like, how do you, you know, what do you, how do you get around the fact that there's a, a little bit of a difference in teachings and and things like that and and what he said and this is what i believe about politics is like whatever you are believe that 100 percent, and that's how you get to heaven right if you're if you're a baptist believe that 100 percent. be that and you should be fine if you're a catholic be catholic and that's how i feel about if you get behind a candidate and and you and you like that candidate get out there and make your voice heard be behind that candidate be you know you might not agree with everything they say but if that's the one you've chosen to put your you know your, your voice behind do it you know and again i say that in swing states now if we can get to a preferred choice or preferred ranking system if we can maybe get back to some congressional districts that might help a little bit um but what i will say this is what i do every four years when it's time to vote in a national election there's like a website, I think it's called I Side With. Just go there, take a little test, and they'll t it'll tell you who you agree with. And just use that. Like, like so I took it, and like, I think I agreed with the Libertarian candidate 77%. Mm -hmm. And I thought that uh, Trump and Biden would be lower. Like, I would agree with them. I didn't know, I didn't know exactly how it was going to come out. 
But like Trump was 70%. I agree with him on 70% of the issues that they, you know, had in the questionnaire. And that sort of shocked me. And then, like, you had all these other third party, and then Biden was at the very low, at like 33%. And I was like, I cannot justify voting for Biden if I only agree with him 33% of the time. I just, I don't care. I don't care what you say about these candidates, you know, you know, whatever you think about them. If pol pol policy is what matters, really, like if you really want to try to get all the, the, the well, showmanship. Okay. Theoretically, out of it, that is what matters. Yes, because yes. I don't think that's what people vote for. No, it's not. But it's what people should vote for. I think people, because I mean, it changes all the time. Yeah. Um. Because I remember a long time ago, it seemed like the two things that were pretty maximum, maximized when I was in high school and younger were, were it was abortion and capital punishment seemed to be like the social, the ongoing social issues of the time. Yeah. Like, and it, it, they just continually morph like into different rights, different things. Social issues always seem like the most peculiar thing to me because it, it's never, it's, it's sort of the flavor of the week kind of yeah. thing with a social yeah. issue on either side. But hardcore policy, economics, uh, geopolitical, those are pretty standardized to, like, they don't change that much. You either you either have kind of an aggressive stance on some things, mm -hmm. or you don't. Or you have uh, sort of uh, pull yourself up with it. I don't think that either, the, the way taxes and stuff are done, I don't necessarily agree across the board. Like, I like taxes because... There's a cost benefit to helping out people who are helpless. Mm -hmm. There's a cost benefit to roads. There's a cost benefit to all these things that I enjoy. So taxes are very important. What I don't understand is, is like people who want to tax like really heavily corporations and stuff, but they want to give it into the hands of people who literally lost a trillion dollars. Just the Pentagon alone lost a trillion. They spent like $4 million just trying to resand beaches. <laughs> you know, I think the CDC rearranged their office in D.C. Rearranged their office. Yeah. You rearranged your office when we worked together once a freaking week, right? <laughs> you know how much it cost the CDC to do it? How much? I think it was like $3 million. Jeez. Look, pay me $3 million. I'll rearrange your whole office by myself. <laughs> That's who you're talking about giving the money to. Yeah. But I think if you can use, I think it was... Uh, I think Milton Freeman said something about this. There's a couple other people who have said stuff, and I know these are traditionally conservative individuals, but I would like to incentivize taxing. Mm. Um, no, wait, Milton Freeman. Is that right? Milton something. It yeah, doesn't matter. Right. All I'm saying is, is like, I want to incentivize taxing. In other words, if I can hit the corporation with, say, a 50% tax, right? Mm -hmm. That's heavy, and it's not really helping anyone because it's going to government, but if you can incentivize the breaks by giving it to the employees which allows them to have more money to spend and direct the economy based on individual choice, I'm all about that. So it's like, we if you do not want to pay your employees, then give it to the government, but if you want to break, get these tax breaks by giving low-level employees an up incentive or whatever, then do that. That would redirect some of the finances, but giving it to the government to make decisions on where that money is going is going to just lose you money. And that's not a hundred percent. It's not like I'm just saying. Like that's just one thing. Yeah, yeah. I think trickle down, which is giving mass amounts of tax breaks and hoping that that money goes back into other people. That doesn't always work. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't. I'm not necessarily against corporate bonuses and structures like that because. Sometimes those people are putting up majority of the risk. Yeah. But at the same time, like 100% trickle down where you're just like, we'll give them tax breaks and then it'll go back into the economy. That doesn't always work yeah. either. But then again, neither does taxing everyone into oblivion and assuming that you can help them up. That doesn't work either. It's kind of like you need to give individuals the ability to choose where their dollar goes. That's what really blossoms everything. And I don't mean individuals as I'm talking about like citizens. Yeah. Yeah. I want people to have the ability to do, and I still want taxes there to help people who cannot do. Yeah. People who are like incapable of working, incapable almost of certain levels of thought. Like there's nothing sadder to me than someone who has like a cognitive disorder in their fifties or sixties. 
because the odds are that their parents or the caregiver did like it makes me upset like just thinking about mm -hmm. it because i got like a soft spot for it like every year i try to do an angel tree to people who are elderly and alone or abandoned mm -hmm. or the same thing for people with a cognitive or learning disability or like to a level that they can't help themselves that tears me up on the inside mm -hmm. like if you were to say to me and you could prove that 50 percent of my paycheck went to people who could not help themselves I wouldn't complain if I could, if you could a hundred percent show it yeah. and it helped them out because it's like, it's not, it's not right. It's just, it sucks. Like I can't even explain it. Like kids, that stuff just it tears me up. So those programs and things exist for a very specific reason. But if you're capable of doing something on your own and you're given that money to make those decisions, mm -hmm. like, I think that's where it should go. I think individuals yeah should be allowed but we have enough taxes and stuff to kind of still keep a standing military mm -hmm. presence etc helping with the roads and stuff like that and helping with people who can't help themselves i mean i don't feel like that's too much to ask and i agree and i, I and if that's what was happening that'd be great and what sort of is upsetting about it is that a lot of people think they're for those you know more social policies thinking that's what's happening but it's not not to the extent that they think it is or that it should be well it's like you know i now i don't disagree with a lot of groups who are doing activision and activism and st activision that's that video game company <laughs> activism and you know but i think like on a national level activism sort of doesn't work to me i think that it's localized and that's where you see the difference i think people were so concerned with national interference policy giving money to these organizations who end up dumping it into politicians pockets who really don't need it that they sort of lose sight of that money going back into their local community i mean like i've seen organizations from church organizations all the way to you know, I don't, it's easier for me to say church because I'm involved in the church. It's hard for me to, like, call out other organizations. I don't really like doing it too much. But you can look and see where their money goes, and you can see it going into the pockets of politicians and people who are in the political arena. And it's like, how is that helping your community? And I don't agree with that. I want it to go where it helps. Yeah. So it's hard for me just to give money to an organization when I can see the money flowing. Like, the Salvation Army is a good example of I know where the money's going. Mm -hmm. I can see my angel tree helping. I can see my money helping because they post it up. They don't pay a lot to the people who are running the shows or anything like that. It's very limited. And then a lot of that money goes right into those communities and things like that. Which and then you look at other organizations. I think Goodwill is a good example. They, they say they're not for profit, but they kind of are, you know? Yeah. I think anybody who gets in a political arena is no longer a nonprofit. I think they should be taxed. And that goes for churches, too. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with taxing churches or anything like that. I don't agree with taxing charities. But if I think if you want to get into the political arena, like then you're playing a different game now. Yeah. Because you're not helping. You're giving it to people who really don't need the money. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to, hard to side with uh, anybody saying that, like, Trump like blue collar hero kind of guy that everyone he says he supports or biden says he's for the 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 common man and then it's like they drive to their mansions like it's like what are, like how are you for i don't see that so it's like to me you don't need that money yeah so then i just don't i think everything that you say is suspect now it's hard for me to appreciate any candidate i feel like there's a right thing and i think it's a mixture of the two and it's hard to like sort of uproot people from that that sort of archaic thinking of my party your party well yeah because it's easier it's so much easier to just pick a few things that you agree with and then what, what party is it or you know what have you always grown up being right mm -hmm. i think that the you know always growing up my you know my dad's always voted this my grandfather's always you know we've always done this that sort of traps people in their own kind of thing especially in the south because you know democrats used to be the more conservative party and especially you know with a lot of um union workers and things like that but like the union used to be a really good organization yeah it helped people progress yeah that's what it did and then it became political and it was corrupted it's like anything it, i feel like even with politicians like i don't necessarily think anyone steps into that arena in the beginning 
who isn't idealistic and trying to do something to better. And I think that they just get, once you get to a certain level, you're only interested in power in your own progression. And therefore, you're no longer on my radar as someone who's helping anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone who gets into politics gets into it really for the right reason. Maybe at the beginning when they're aspiring, they have like political aspirations that could be you know what is the word where it's like uh, you do something selfless it's called something altruism yeah I think like you can have these altruistic motives mm -hmm. when you're sort of in that ideological political aspirational phase yeah but after that like it, it, I think it all goes down the toilet well that that sort of goes into the aspect of how can you be a leader over a certain like a, once you get to a certain amount of people you represent how can you help everyone at that point well you can't i mean like that's that's the shortcomings of all things yeah you have to sort of go with a majority you have to go with a census and you've got to sort of try to get to that uh i think 70 percent is a good marker mm -hmm. like you were saying you took the political test and 70 yeah. percent. i think if you can try to get within that 70 to 80 percent yeah like that's the marker you want to hit yeah i don't think you can there like i don't believe any organization at all can be something you're 100 percent for no unless maybe it's cult you know like mm -hmm. it's a cult yeah but i mean you think about it like you and i don't agree on everything mm -hmm. so if you and i organized and it was just the two of us yeah. automatically it's not 100 percent in agreement we're automatically yeah. at odds because you and i are two different people we don't necessarily come to terms or agree on every single thing so any organization that I guess it doesn't really count as an organization, but any type of thing that goes above the numeric value of one is flawed automatically because two individuals, unless cloned or part of some sort of hive mind, mm -hmm. they can't agree. Yeah. Unless it's like maybe cult. And then even yeah. that has like a lot of social engineering and brainwashing in it. Even that mm -hmm. has dissent in it. You know? Yeah. The Branch Davidians mm -hmm. weren't just the Branch Davidians. I mean, they broke off from like Seventh day Adventists and stuff. Yeah, but, but I would also say um, that flaw does, you know, create, because, you know, you were saying you want to, we want to, we want to have taxes to protect the people who can't be protected. So and, and, and have infrastructure and yeah. things that are necessary. Yeah. I mean, but, there is still, military isn't just fighting. There is a certain amount of innovation yeah. that comes with it that actually oh, yeah. is helpful to the yeah. population. We didn't have military, a lot of things we would, we probably right. wouldn't have cell phones right now. Right, exactly. So there, there is benefits yeah. that come from certain amounts of spending. But yes, one of the things is you want to help people mm -hmm. that are helpless. But then you want people to have enough comfort, enough uh, of a safety and security to, um, well, one, invest back in the economy. And then also, you know, live comfortable, not right. be living off pennies. So, like, the best way to get that is some kind of combination compromise between, you know, a, a right-leaning agenda and a left-leaning agenda. Like, if you go full right, a lot of people may get uh, left behind by the wayside. A lot of people that need help. But exactly. if you go completely left, everybody then, is going to suffer no, there a is bit. A, Yeah, there's going to be a suffering of... I think if you're going like to the to the extent that some of the left are preaching, this is not everyone. This isn't you know, there is some economic downturn that comes with that because yeah. you can't reinvest as an individual. Yeah, and the reason people invest in general any of their wealth or anything is because the risk to reward ratio can get them more and it can benefit yeah. them. I'm talking about yeah. stocks and yeah. you know that kind of investing. You you sort of limit that when people don't yeah. have you know available income. Yeah, and and to sort of make this, I know a lot of this has been more on a on a, a downy kind of thing, talking about how crazy the world is, but I guess to sort of bring it back up high, that's what gets me more aggravated. You know, I think America does a great compromise. I think we, as much as I hate the two party system, I also think the two party system at least helps in a compromise of there is enough level of, you know, if you had, you know. If you work hard and you you know you you, you have a, enough good luck, you you can do anything you want to do. You, and, and then I think enough people are being helped, but definitely not enough. You know, we we can always do more, but there's a nice balance. 
I, I think America is doing the best that America can. The United States can. And, and it, whether that's economic, whether that's, you know, uh, tensions, whether it be uh, racial or anything like that. Well, we do what we gonna, can. We're definitely going to find out if it's sustainable. The, yeah. I think the, the United States does the best job. I mean, because I love point. There's a lot of um, videos on YouTube that you can watch. If you ever get a, a kind of an itch to do it, you can watch... Uh, it's usually like, what do the Dutch think about the U.S. or something yeah. like that? Or what do the French think about the United States? And you're going to hear a lot of the, the the general slander that you hear. Like, they're fat, they're stupid, blah, 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 blah. But one of the things that always struck me as interesting is they, they have a tendency to say, well, they're racist. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the background, and it's all one race. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm like, how do you even how can you even come to terms with that when you only live in a homogenized society yeah like it doesn't seem plausible that you can comment effectively on race like this was a dutch person speaking it seems very strange that you can comment on it when a majority the, like i literally watched the entire video and it was just young white dutch people walking yep. around now, i'm not saying that there isn't uh multi-ethnic groups and in, in you know the netherlands or whatever i am saying though that it seems sort of hypocritical when it looks like you're living in a homogenized society to comment on what it would be like to be completely integrated to a level that the u.s is and and i would say that even happens on a domestic level between like you know outside the south versus the south i feel like outside the south views the south as racist but uh, if you look at percentages i mean we're more Multi. We're more integrated or multi multicultural for sure. Yeah. Like it's I don't know. It's it's I, sort of it's weird. kinda hard to understand racism to a certain extent when you've grown up in black and white communities your whole life. Like it's kinda weird that there's there kind of is this us them. I've interacted with blacks, whites, Hispanics, yeah. whatever, yeah. forever, and it doesn't seem like at a local level there's a lot of animosity it feels like it oh, seems like when it takes to a national stage that's when the animosity just shows up yeah and it's it's like because i was saying that way back when i know the one of the first big inc incidences that happened i'm i know there's several before this but the one i remember is the the ferguson situation with uh was it mike brown was that his name? michael brown yeah yeah um you know and my, and my thought was I, I just don't see this coming to the south because it doesn't feel that way like i don't f feel that animosity now granted a lot of that might have been media pushing and things like that and you know the control of the narrative communities but. can be segregated by them by people by themselves yeah. and then it can be there can be you know nothing i mean like there's a this is a there's a quote and um the canterbury tells which says that i'm gonna paraphrase but it's just like uh any statement made in jest has like kind of a nugget of truth in it mm -hmm. that is not it i butchered it but basically any joke that really is worth its salt yeah kind of has a little truth in it well i can say the same thing for anything that hits national stage too yeah like people who say that there's systemic racism there might not be to the extent but to say that there it doesn't exist yeah, I feel like that's pretty implausible. I yeah. feel like everything has that nugget of truth in it. It might not be to one extreme or the other. Like, there's none or it's only. But yeah. there's something in there that you should look at. And the problem is, is people can't look at things and be like, yeah, this is a problem. I mean, the statue thing. Uh, Civil War statue, yeah. you know? I think... The, I'm not for Civil War statues in a city area like a city hall area yeah, like a, or something. A, anything that's government property any government property probably shouldn't have like a, so i think they yeah. could go to a memorial or something yeah. like that's fine yeah. but i think one of the problems is is like because we're really talking about you're talking about race in this issue so it's kind of a black versus white thing is what it does kind of come off as or yeah. white versus black and i think one of the issues is like how many like black leaders have statues erected for them like like if you i can ask anyone name five famous black national figures that progress and you're gonna say malcolm x mlk harriet tubman uh frederick Douglass, 
Rosa Parks. Yeah. You know, that's probably going to be the five that's going to get named. If you say name a famous black scientist, you're probably going to say George Washington Carver. You know? Um, mm -hmm. There's clearly more. Yeah. And there are local levels. You know, one of the things is, is like they want, there's a, a, a kind of a, a natural uh, inclination to destroy without anything that would elevate it. In other words, if I think if sometimes if you were to elevate the status of black leaders in a community or something like that by erecting a, a statue instead of worrying about tearing down a civil war, maybe people would look at the other statue and be like, who cares about that? Yeah. You know, not to say that a multicultural landscape like the U.S. doesn't have, mm -hmm. like, doesn't mean that their history is like that history, the history of the Civil War and stuff doesn't mean that it's not important. It's just like, I feel like the issue is to destroy and not to elevate. And I think yeah. that's worrisome sometimes for me because it's like, what are we learning from this? Well, we're learning that blacks are marginalized, but what have we given them to elevate? Yeah. like nothing it seems like in that case like it's like you're just tearing it down but there's no replacement yeah there's nothing like even a replacement seems like a better plan than just to destroy is what i'm saying yeah but i think if you erected things that actually propped up a, a portion of history that should be all over the south yeah oh yeah there's definitely going to be civil rights leaders and localized heroes that can be at least a placard something yeah, yeah. that could push you into a scenario where you feel more unified i feel like that's the problem is destroying seems like it's actually just creating a larger and larger rift in between communities and that's what you don't want yeah i, I agree and sort of i think i mean like i could be wrong i'm not right about everything or, or you know i do think that like you know what i mean if i think if you definitely asked average americans they're only going to be able to name like five maybe six black leaders yeah that's not good. I mean, it is American history. You know, yeah. that is something that, like, who, what do you know? Yeah. You know? Well, you know, the, what was it, the... But the, I also think you can't discredit the military expertise of, like, General Lee or Stonewall yeah. Jackson yeah. either. I'm not saying that they need to be in a government facility, their statues, but I think that also trying to eliminate a historical context, especially if you use that in, like studying battle plans and things like that those things are useful thomas jefferson founded this country and his philosophy really erected it that doesn't mean he was 100 percent great at everything yeah. i mean he clearly had slaves and he clearly had sex with those slaves probably against their will most likely yeah that does that's monstrous but you can't discredit the stuff that he did that founded our country either. Yeah. It's a complicated issue. Well, where you don't want to, Yeah. Well, no individual living has a clean slate. No. You, you, you I don't want to glorify someone. evil. No. But also, I think we're not elevating good either. Well, that, and that's a weird thing. Like, it's like if you're, if, you're, if you're casting stones right now and trying to tear down everything and destroy... What are you elevating that's actually good, that we can look to as something greater than the things that you're tearing down? There's no resolution beyond destroying. And that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. And I think it ties into what we were talking about, about, you know, the, the larger majority that you're trying to be a leader of, the harder it gets. That even goes into the more, I mean, I, I want us to be multicultural, but the more and more that we get multicultural, cultural, um, the harder it would be because, say, you are voting for a white mayor and his city is, you know, as multicultural as you can get. The percentages don't give a majority to anybody. Just because of the way things work, people are going to have a problem supporting a white person or a black person or it's, it's someone of Hispanic descent because they feel like they can't relate to the person, which I've always found, again, coming from a, a white male's brain, uh, upbringing, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people who have been, you know, excited for, like, that Black Panther movie, right? I heard people say, well, that it's finally someone I can see my, you know, like, a, from a black person's perspective. I can see myself as that person. Or, you know, Miles Morales being a, I believe he's African-American and Hispanic. Yeah. It's like seeing Spider-Man as that person, as someone that looks like me. I've heard mm -hmm. people, you know, not, not me, but th that person's perspective. And to, I just... 
I've never really. That I've never. That's never bothered me. You know. Well, I mean, like, I love Blade and Spawn, and they're both African American yeah. heroes, like in comics. You know. Yeah, I don't. And I love them. Yeah, you I could see but yourself I didn't really as them. Think of it as like he's black. I could never be that. Yeah, I know. It, but 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 then because Blade's awesome. Yeah, yeah, Blade is awesome. Like you said, Spawn's awesome. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? I like the Falcon in in the Marvel stuff. Power um, Man, uh, Cage. Oh, yeah, Luke Cage. Luke Cage. Like me watching the Luke Cage show on Netflix. You know, with all its flaws, I generally love the guy. Like I would like to be like yeah, him. Because Luke Cage reminds me of an everyman. And yeah. I, I don't see why I can't get behind that. No, it, but but of course, yeah. But I mean, like you know, I do think that having multi-ethnic characters isn't a bad thing. No. My problem is is when you try to the only. This is, this is where it's going to get controversial, I guess. My problem is, is when I don't like it when you want to make. I don't really have a good justification for this either, so this could come off really in poor taste. But I don't like it when you like. It would be like if I wanted to make Luke Cage white, yeah, or Batman black. Like, no, I want them to be what they are and i want a new cooler you know lgbtq character mm -hmm. or i want a new cooler black character invent something new that i'm going to get behind you don't have to ram something into an existing character to me that just seems like poor writing i guess is what i'm saying well like yeah. why wouldn't you be able to innovate like you created blade someone created blade and he's awesome yeah someone they... created john constantine and he's awesome and he's gay yeah yeah. Why can't we just have new things that are just as cool? We, they exist. I've seen them. We live. Okay, look at this. Look. At I this. just feel like people aren't original. Well, and that's the that's the thing. We live in a time where people have more access to anything ever. You can research anything to your heart's desire. Till you're blue in the face. Well, you could just do, you could do anything. We live in a, a world where, in some states, marijuana is legal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, in most all states, you can at least access it to a certain extent. Uh, I'm not advocating for you to access it illegally. I'm just saying right. there's avenues out there. Creativity should be at an all-time high. And all we're getting or is remakes. Re, you know, you're just kind of inserting whatever into whatever. It doesn't seem like anything's very original no, anymore. No, and I don't know. Like, I, I can understand it like... When it comes to, like, minor characters, like, you know, I, I think there was a character in, like, the Daredevil show that in the comics was a white male. They turned it into a, a white female who was also a lesbian. Is a minor character. It doesn't change things. It it, it it does make things more inclusive, and it's fine. That's that's fine. Because it's it's a side character that didn't matter. I'm not saying that that character now shouldn't matter. I'm just saying doing things like that helps is part of this where it helps bring people more inclusive it includes more people but like changing daredevil to a lesbian woman just create a new character please well it's yeah it, it's it's kind of like one of those things where it's like i'm actually commenting on something i don't really care about yeah i'll give you an example of something i did care about i just i remember when star wars came out and uh people were pressing the force awakens not yeah. the 77 version the Force Awakens came out, and I remember arguing with people about John Biega, who's, who's black, and then being like, oh, it's just multicultural shenanigans, which is stupid, because it's Star Wars, you can have any character. I mean, it's Land not, of Calrissian's it, awesome. But here's yeah. the point that I'm trying to make. They were attacking John Boyega, and I was defending him, not because he's black, but because I saw Attack the Block, and he's awesome in that movie. Oh. If you haven't seen Attack the Block, go watch it. It's like one of the best... Like, you guys think Stranger Things is good? If you think that, go watch Attack the Block. It makes Stranger Things look like just mm. rice pudding garbage. Like, it's just... <laughs> it, there is originality out there. I remember just... I remember loving John. I remember when he... Because I remember the first trailer where he, like, jumps up and he's breathing really heavy. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Attack the Block guy. I didn't know his name at the time. I was like, that movie is so great. Yeah. And it's, it's about young, multicultural, like, multi-ethnic people in london defending their block their lower class it's fast it's one of the best science fiction movies i've ever seen in my entire life yeah and i remember like sitting there and being like you guys don't like john boyega because he's black that seems pretty prejudiced to me 
he's amazing in attack the block. Why don't you watch it? Yeah, yeah. You know? And I just have to sit there and have to defend this kind of stuff in a world where clearly they're just creating new characters. Now, what they did with Finn in Star Wars is an abomination because John Boyega has range. He's very interesting. Yeah. And they just ruined his character. And I'd be pissed if I was them too. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Finn, uh, Finn and uh, Ray, they're like the most boring, kind of obnoxious characters ever. And Daisy Ridley, Daisy Ridley's not really a good actress, in my opinion. But, like, they definitely could have had range. Yeah. And it could have been more interesting than what it was. And I feel like they sort of whiffed on that whole series. Uh, that whole sequel trilogy thing. But... Man, like, you're talking about ta really talented people. Yeah. You had one of the most insanely awesome casts ever. Um, John Boyega is super amazing. Adam Driver is amazing. Who's yeah. the Poe guy? I can't remember. Oh, uh, Oscar Isaac. Oscar Isaac. Yeah, oh, he... my God. I love him and stuff. Like, yeah, Oscar he, he's, Isaac was, he's good in a lot of stuff. He's super amazing. He was good in uh, Ex Machina. He was good in that, what's that um, science fiction movie where the rift is coming through South Florida and Southern Alabama. You read the series. Oh, uh, oh, um, Annihilation. Annihilation. He was yeah, great in yeah, that. Yeah, he was good in that. Uh, I love him. I think he's going to be great in Dune. I'm super excited to see him in Dune. Yeah, yeah. He, I think he was. But good you, like, cast. you had one of the most amazing casts ever. New cast. I'm not talking about this nostalgia crap where you got Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill. I'm talking about new cast members who are incredibly talented, and you whiffed. On almost every character. Because you can't write. That yeah. has nothing to do with multi-ethnic. That doesn't have to do with anything of me saying prejudice or not prejudice. It just you just can't write. You're terrible writers, and you can't create anything good. That's not good because it's all about again, like you said, the nostalgia crap. Create as many moments of nostalgia and you can create anything. I feel like I love characters that have range or interesting that I can dive into that like do something different. Well, we really got off politics pretty hard, didn't we? But like, um, <laughs> but I mean, like, it just seems strange that like we're in that scenario where. People well, just seem to like they they. It's like it does if they're vanilla and bland or milk toast or just boring. It doesn't matter who they are, what they look like, what they present themselves out. It's still just bad writing. Yeah, and but another thing too, it's it's another part of it is uh, the what is it the the justification for it, right? So like you know we're talking about um, comic books, kind of. You know, people, them sort of changing characters, uh, sexuality or, or their race or anything like that. But like, it, you know, I want there to be comic book characters for everybody, you know, every kind of person. But the, but the, but the, the what matters at the end of the day, if, if that comic book can't sell, they're not going to make many of them anyway. Right. And the, you got to look at your demographics. Majority of people who read comic books are probably white males and that might change but like i think that it's not really helping the situation by changing it, it just doesn't seem like it lends itself to creativity if you're not writing new things that are interesting yeah like, i've seen things written that are new that are terrible that are just like the white avenger with super abs like he's boring too like mm. i don't want to see that you can make something new and interesting and i've seen old comics like i've seen batman comics that'll bore you to tears dude oh god that doesn't make them interesting you know yeah i like, mean everything in the silver age is dumb to me yeah yeah i don't know, I don't know. It, yeah it, it, there, oh, listen <laughs> the thing is is like the split between the united states is no, i don't understand like in, in pop culture and politics religion whatever it doesn't seem like we have anything well, what is interesting is is that we're not actually elevating anything to unify yeah we're just trying to destroy anything that might be something that represents uh, division. division yeah and it's like well what are we looking towards that's going to bring us together and yeah, i don't think any i definitely think no political party has that answer and i don't think anyone else has that answer either right now because they're definitely not presenting anything that we can all unify behind all they're doing is creating a void which then in turn creates people to clamor to something that's sort of you right. know a trumpian you know it could be trumpian or sub these subgroups like uh sub is in like below not sub is in like like subhuman or something like that Someone commented on that one time, and I didn't like it, so I just always make sure, uh, like, subcategorization is what I'm saying. Yeah. 
like that you're really fracturing you're fracturing and fracturing and you're getting more and more tribal in these small pockets of individual levels mm -hmm. that you really have no unifying voice i think that's the problem that the left might be experiencing and i think the right lends itself to somewhat more of a cohesion more cohesion but like in a direction that is blindly followed sometimes yeah yeah i don't know there's really no way to f fix this it, just let the train go yeah i don't think there is an answer to that i think we're just addressing it because it's on our minds so heavily yeah. and it's been difficult to not talk about it when you and i get together yeah but so if you hopefully if you stayed to listen to this you know don't worry we're not gonna do this isn't gonna be a regular occurrence we're gonna keep ourselves it's like true. you know it seemed like something we we'd been talking about before we do any episode yeah. i think we we always have some sort of political discourse if you're around us enough in real life you would understand that uh, we sort of segue in between pop culture and politics you know pretty seamlessly yeah. and we've always tried to keep it you know pretty neutral and i think even this isn't very one-sided on anything but like i could be wrong i'm sure someone will say that it's very one-sided that we're either bleeding hearts or fascists but like uh <laughs> <laughs> um but the thing is i think we just wanted to do one episode just to kind of get it off our minds because yeah. we in this kind of climate especially post-election it's pretty much all you're thinking about yeah i mean it, it's is if we we're going to do an episode like it, it here's the time because yeah. it's it's on everybody's mind and and right. it's not going to go away for a little bit but at least from here on out you'll have something to right. light your pipe up to and escape to i guess yeah and, um so hopefully you enjoyed it if you left us <laughs> we'll see you next well yeah, i guess we'll see any month. we'll see everybody next month so um outside of that and like a couple of little one-off things before we close out uh we do want to set up a, a commentary thing where we watch a movie we tell you what movie we're watching you can sync it up and listen to us comment mm -hmm. at the same time we're thinking about doing a couple of horror movies and then we're going to be back to our regularly scheduled sort of discussions on pop culture and reading lists and things like that yeah, yeah hopefully we don't dive into the political arena it's going to be interesting to see if anyone wants to hear more of this which yeah. i don't think that's going to sway my opinion on not doing it again yeah. or at least not for four years yeah yeah maybe every four years maybe every we'll... four years like a sort of <laughs> leap year like thing that we do every time we bring out every four years when we bring back out thanksgiving day we'll we'll discuss, we'll discuss. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh well, we hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the holiday season, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll get another episode in before the end of the year. Yep. Y'all have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Catch you later.